Hello friends, this is the second part of my little video series in which I explain how you can add a line in and also optionally a Bluetooth receiver to old compact stereo systems or boomboxes. And I really recommend you to watch the first part before this one in order to better understand what I'm going to show you in this episode. So in the first part I spent a couple of minutes trying to give you an overview over the different basic functional blocks of a device like that and I also said what kind of changes I would make in order to add the line in and the Bluetooth receiver. Okay, so I'd imagine that a lot of what I've been talking about in the last episode might have been a little too complicated for at least some of the viewers and in order to correct that I will now show you first a very easy quick and dirty way to hack a line in connection into a circuit like this. And I will do that with temporary wires that will then be replaced by proper ones and I will spend the rest of the video improving on that initial crude idea and then also add the Bluetooth receiver. So let's get right into it. Over the course of the years and also in my various related videos, I use different methods of hacking a line in into the existing circuitry. Sometimes I use signal wires of the radio, sometimes of a CD player if the unit has one. But my most successful method so far is to use the audio path of the cassette decks. And I do that because it is very easy to find the cassette pre-amplifiers and that is all you need to do in order to find out where the line in can be hacked into the circuit. So what you do is to look for the pre-amplifier circuit that is often very close to the wires coming from the cassette decks themselves entering the PCB. And once you have found that chip, you write down the type number and you type that into Google together with the word datasheet. And with any luck you will be able to find the datasheet of that circuit. And what you have to do now is to find out which of the pins are the output pins and which one is the ground pin of the chip. And somewhere in the datasheet you will find some kind of block diagram. Here we have a diagram that also includes some typical peripheral circuitry of the circuit, but that is actually not interesting right now. We have to focus only on the pinouts. And we can see that pins 5 and 20 are the two outputs. And on another page in the datasheet you will then find the pinout of the actual package, in this case a dual inline package. And here I labeled the pins 5 and 20 as the two outputs A and B. And the next thing is of course to take a look at the preamplifier on your board. And here I am under the board of my stereo system. And what you do now is to count the pins in order to find the outputs. And think about it. In the data sheet you typically have a top view picture with the numbers of the pins. Here we are looking from the underside on the bottom of the chip. So keep that in mind when you want to find the outputs. And what I'm doing is simply to temporarily solder ordinary wires to these pins. And I also scrape off some of the silk screen on this ground plane here that is connected to pin 7, the ground of the preamplifiers. And in the permanent hack I'm going to use shielded flexible audio wires for this, but I'm using these blue wires here just for this first quick and dirty demonstration. And in the meantime I have connected those three wires to an RCA cable that runs via an RCA to 3.5 millimeter plug to the headphone jack of my smartphone. And you can also see that I have pushed the play button on the tape deck here, but without inserting a cassette. So as you can see it can be as easy as that to inject a sound signal from your smartphone into an old stereo system like this at the output pins of the cassette preamplifier. But this quick and dirty setup has also some large disadvantages. For one the play button of the cassette drive has to be activated and also the cassette drive is running and producing quite a lot of noise that is amplified by the preamplifier stage and that signal is then mixed with the output signal of your phone. So the sound quality is rather bad and you also always have to run the cassette drive in order to use the setup. 
So then let us just see how we can improve on this and make this more convenient to use. And by the way, just a little warning here, if you're operating on an open device like I'm doing here, please use batteries to power it or at least use an isolation transformer like this one. A video about it can be found in the video description. In my opinion, one of the best I ever made. Okay, so let's step by step solve the issues that I just mentioned. The first thing that I will do is to add a switch to the front panel. And the switch that I found here in the workshop has two opening and two closing contacts that are mechanically coupled together. You know, the dotted line doesn't mean that there is an electrical connection between these switches. It means that they are all activated at the same time because they are coupled. Now in Germany we call this zweimal ein und zweimal aus, which means two times on and two times off. I'm not exactly sure how you call that in English. Maybe two opening, two closing contacts. And you could have done this another way, but this is what I have and it turns out to be quite useful for this application. So what is going to happen is that the two upper switches will cut off the connection between the two preamplifiers for left and right and the inputs of the equalizer. And on the output side of these switches, we will then permanently solder and install two RCA line-in connectors. In order to implement that, I cut away a section of the conductive paths under the PCB directly at the output pins of the preamplifier chip. And I do it so that I can solder audio wires to both sides of that cutoff path. And next, a hole is drilled into the front panel where there is space enough to hold the switch that I have shown you. Next I want to place RCA connectors at the back side of the device and for that of course holes have to be drilled again and the jacks are installed with a screw. Next I take these old used DIN and RCA connector cables here that I no longer use. I cut them off and I solder them to the RCA connectors, to the switch and to the PCB near the preamplifier as I have shown in the circuit diagram about a minute ago. And after having finished this part of the work, I put it all back together temporarily and let's have a second test then. Okay, so the first issue being the noise coming from one of the cassette drives is no longer a problem because we can simply cut off the signal path between the output of the preamplifiers by activating the switch. But we still have to press the play button of one of the tape drives in order to hear music coming from the line in. And I'm going to solve the problem in the following way. Now, when you push the play button, these two little copper contacts here on the back side of the cassette drive are being pushed together. They are now in contact. And once that happens, the power amplifier is activated and the source selector selects the tape drives as the sound source. So what I'm going to do is to bypass these two copper contacts with our third, the first of the actively closing switches on the front panel. So we will be able to activate the line in completely independent of the tape drives. And for that I simply solder two ordinary copper wires to the copper contacts near the cassette drive and lead them to the contacts of the third switch on the front panel. Okay, so as you can see, we can now operate the cassette drives and the line-in input completely independently from each other. And as far as a line-in hack goes, this is really all you have to do. But of course, I still wanted to show you how I installed a Bluetooth receiver inside the stereo system. But this video is again about 10 minutes long. I've been working on it for the entire day. So I guess there will be a third part 
and we will see each other tomorrow then again. So I hope you like this and see you tomorrow.